In this project, we are going to explore a way of using sound that has to do with people contributing, geolocating, sharing, and modifying sounds uploaded and tagged to specific public spaces. Social soundscaping. On October 23, 2012, the Wall Street Journal ran an article called The Search for Sweet Sounds That Sell which described a number of corporations' past, present, and future concerns with product sounds. For instance, Snapple has long traded on its own distinctive pop, indicating freshness, quality, and safety. Additionally, the Wall Street Journal noted that the consequence of sound is no longer insubstantial for items like feminine products or chip wrappers that should make no sound at all. This warning follows a 2010 announcement that Frito-Lay had decided to mostly scrap its eco-friendly packaging of Sun Chips because the bag was described and harped on by consumers as too noisy. This attention is not new if we recall, as the Wall Street Journal does, other products that have traded on sound in the past, such as the Snap Crackle Pop of Rice Krispies or the Plop Plop Fizz Fizz of Alka-Seltzer. However, what does seem to have changed is the explicit attention to sound design, where consumers and designers are both able to speak about the sounds that are desirable for different products, for different reasons, and for different audiences. It's important to note how these corporations may be increasingly intentional in the ways they shape our shared soundscapes. However, what interests us more is what can we do to speak back to our spaces. What resistance or replacement of soundscapes is possible through mobile technology? The idea that we live in a sound-rich environment is certainly not new, although Kaiser has noted in his book, The Unwanted Sound of Everything We Want, that not much compares with the decibel level of things like airplanes, as many sound historians have shown. People have complained about sound since pre-industrial times, when noise pollution could be found in the form of church and village bells. <laughs> So why is this important? For the longest time, we've had three choices for how to deal with shared soundscapes. Turn to the reification of silence with noise pollution laws. Retreat into the private soundscapes of headphones and iPods. Or drown out the problem by replacing the sounds of spaces publicly with our own sounds through boom boxes, cell phone chatter, or megaphones. However, what we're beginning to see is a fourth alternative. Social soundscaping. In social soundscaping, multiple users are able to contribute sounds to spaces by geolocating or tagging them in a specific space using a device, interface, and GPS. Through geotagging, these sounds are then attached to a location and can appear on a map. Then other users can access the sounds through a network and listen to them through headphones. In this way, many different people can access soundscapes that are shared, contributed to, and altered socially, but listened to individually. Earlier examples of social soundscaping have included projects like Urban Tapestries and Rider Spoke, which have focused on enabling people to geotag stories and spaces that other users may then listen to. For example, Rider Spoke asked participants to go to an out-of-the-way part of the city and record some of their intimate memories. Other participants can then access these stories as they move to that physical location where the memory was recorded. However, other listeners are not able to alter the stories once they are contributed. Listeners can add new stories, but existing ones cannot be modified. One project that brings together the ability of many listeners to socially contribute and access nonverbal sounds with the ability to modify is Tactical Sound Gardens which is the best current example of what we mean by social soundscaping technology. Tactical Soundgarden allows users to plant sounds, access them within the physical space, and even prune sounds that have already been planted by other users by adjusting parameters, like volume or brightness. Mark Shepard and the Tactical Soundgarden designers describe the project as follows. It draws on the culture of urban community gardening to posit a participatory environment where new spatial practices for social interaction within technologically mediated environments can be explored and evaluated. Like the metaphor of the public urban garden, 
in which multiple people contribute and attend to the space, Tactical Sound Garden makes soundscaping into a community project. What excited us about the rhetorical prospect of Tactical Sound Garden is that participants can be both listeners and contributors, and the Sound Garden is dynamic and can be altered by other individuals. Also, unlike verbal story-focused sound projects, Tactical Sound Garden makes nonverbal sounds into a public good and a nonverbal sonic dialogue. When it comes to sounds we don't like, our most common recourse has been to replace existing soundscapes with listening through headphones, whether that means listening to Rihanna or humpback whales. However, choosing to listen to humpback whales has often had more to do with individual preference and aesthetics than rhetorical potential. The Tactical Sound Garden provides us with a rhetorical potential to speak back to spaces through contributing, sharing, and pruning. Tactical Sound Garden allows nonverbal sounds to gain rhetorical presence. Kayan Perlman has described presence as a strategy that prevents certain things from being neglected. Perlman states that the techniques of presentation which create presence are above all essential when it is a question of evoking realities that are distant in time and space. The concept of presence is important to our notion of social soundscaping. Let's say that our public sound garden, the site of our social soundscaping, is a space with numerous uses, like Moore Square in downtown Raleigh. Like many urban spaces, Moore Square includes a variety of sounds that are already present in the environment. Filmmakers would call these sounds diegetic because they match actions in the scene. Planting diegetic sounds could double the sounds already heard in physical space and thus draw our attention to those sounds. However, if we heeded Perlman's second statement, we might also consider planting a sound that might otherwise be distant from Moore Square, or in filmmaking language, an extra diegetic sound, one that typically wouldn't occur within the scene. What could sounds of screams or carnival music say about the social space of Moore Square? Or, to build on this idea of presence, making the distant near, what would it be like to hear the soundscape of Moore Square dislocated in time? Like many urban downtown spaces, Moore Square is a significantly different place during the business week, weekends, and Friday and Saturday nights. During the week, it is a place of commerce, filled with sounds of people walking, outdoor dining, and automobile traffic. However, during weekend, the soundscape of Moore Square is often quiet, reflective. And then, during weekend nights, the space is yet again transformed with the sounds of people drinking on patios and rooftops, waiting in line for bars, and hailing cabs well into the night. What would it be like to hear the sounds of Moore Square on a Friday night while standing in a relatively empty park on a Saturday afternoon? or to walk past bar goers on a Saturday night while listening to a socially produced sound garden of what Moore Square sounds like during a business lunch. What can these types of social soundscapes reveal about a place? All of these examples give shape to how Perlman's concept of presence applies to social soundscaping. Through these social productions of sound, participants would be able to make present that which may be distant in space or time, contributing to new ways of experiencing more square as a dynamic auditory space. Furthermore, because other individuals are able to dialogically prune sounds that have been planted or plant different sounds, these presences can be modified and dynamic over time. In this way, social soundscaping allows individuals the ability to make present ideas that critique, praise, or persuade other listeners about the truths of the space that is being soundscaped. And in addition to nonverbal sounds, users are able to upload optional verbal messages that accompany acts of pruning. This act of social soundscaping is ultimately different from simply replacing the sounds of a space with different sounds because it is social, negotiated, and dynamic we would need to develop a language for soundscaping a place together. Because the mobile technology and the practice of geolocating sounds is still relatively new, it is still unclear what practices people may perpetuate as rhetorical uses for social soundscaping. However, even in the case of Moore Square, 
The ability to plant sounds within or dislocated from the current space allows presence to work differently, either doubling the physical presence of sound or making distant locations or times more present. In either case, it is up to us to develop a language for speaking back to our spaces. Social soundscaping gives us the opportunity to speak back in a shared sense. It gives us a chance to intervene in the sounds we experience, rather than simply turning up the volume of our own private soundscape.